Hey everybody, so today we are going to be going over some of the top trends and considerations that you might want to pay attention to in this year and probably years to come in the multimodal LLM space. Now, in this video, we're going to be dedicating this to imagery, but this certainly will also, the topics covered, apply to video and, and other types of content for the multimodal space. We're focusing on imagery because I am joined with our special guest, Margaret Warren, who just happens to be an expert in imagery metadata. Now, why we're talking about this and why there is a dedicated video is because there is a lot of hype over multimodal, just in general, but also doing more training on multimodal is supposed to help the LLMs get smarter. So that is why there's probably a ton of things that you're going to be seeing this next year in this space and why we wanted to dedicate a video to it. All right. So if this sounds interesting to you. Keep on watching. Well, my name is Margaret Warren and I am a researcher and an artist and a technologist and uh, I like to say that I work in applied metadata science. And so my uh, interest has been in describing images with uh, semantic annotations. Mm -hmm. And I built a system to be able to do that, mm -hmm. which is called image snippets. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very interesting angle to a lot of the things that we cover on this channel, because a lot of things, and I'm sure it's, it's the bane of your existence, a lot of things are very focused on text. Yes. Um, but a, a lot of things now, especially this coming year, um, if you watch my trend video, connecting the yeah. two, I mentioned this video in that one, yes, you um, did. You. is uh, multimodal, which means images and a lot of other things. But and a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, I think that this is going to become a, a hot topic. And one reason I reached out to Margaret about this um, you know, talking about how difficult some of these things are and why it's important to talk about in regards to Gen AI and, you know, a lot of other reasons, by the way, is because she put up a post on LinkedIn that showed a random like picture of, I don't know, an inside of an engine. And I used to work um, in cool. manufacturing, in auto manufacturing and aerospace manufacturing, and I saw videos and standards specifically all the time that came in with like, you know, the most minuscule screw and you had to like figure out what that thing was. And it just resonated with me as soon as I saw that. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a good point. And so that's that's why we wanted to, to talk about this. So we talk about this and we and, and so we talk about, well, when would you need to have this much detail on the description? Like usually three or four keywords is enough to get you in the ballpark of mm -hmm. the description you're trying mm -hmm. to find, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a few examples where it works really well. One is um, when you uh, when you have say three related keywords, it is really interesting to look at all these products made that use the clip system and mm. then like have a conversation with chat GPT mm -hmm. about an image mm -hmm. because what you see that's happening is that you have the system that can even go in, you know, zero shot, no labeling. It can generalize on features that are in the image mm -hmm. and can store all those into the bags of visual words. Mm -hmm. And then you have, and then you can have a little text description there. But what I feel like is, is missing is, is that often that um, description is, is very flat. So, so the pixels do not necessarily represent the relationship of the, of whatever the feature is and like why it's important in context. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. And that can be as simple as it's in the foreground or it's in the background, mm -hmm. or it can be something that it's simply just not ever going to be able to reason about. Mm -hmm. Like I have a wonderful example of of a of an image because um, it's like a, an image that I found in an, in an archives. So my father happened to be a photojournalist, and and my mother also an artist. And I have got this huge archives that I'm working with, mm -hmm. 
And there's a, a place that I work with some, which is the um, Gulf Specimen Marine Laboratory. And the, the, the president of that, Jack Rudlow, is very, very interesting, interesting person. And he he became a specimen collector. But, and uh, he it's really interesting story about him. But but I found these pictures of something he created in the 70s, which was this dock and with a certain net thing on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I think, well, I think this is some sort of net thing that's hanging off the side of the dock, but yeah. I sent it to him and I said, is any of this meaningful? And he's like, oh yeah, this is like the image of the incarnation of the living dock, the, the first incarnation. And it's like, this was a net for horseshoes. What is it? The crab. It's of course, oh. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then he said it was the first attempt at creating a fouling community and an algae hmm. culture. Now, how would, you know, this is one thing that, that first of all, a, a, a system is a, a visual only system. Yeah. It's not going to understand the context as to why. As to why. It's For never going to get that. Yeah. yeah it's never going to get that one. And that that's what's interesting about the image. And almost like, it's almost like the historical context too. Like there's so many images that you see and you're like, oh, oh, that's really ugly or whatever it is. But then you find out it's the first known sketch from like Da Vinci or something. And you're like, oh, right. well, now it's important. Now it's important. Yeah. yeah. And how would you, how would you, you know, these images I feel like are going to continue to get lost mm. sort of the garbage of mm -hmm. the yeah you know but but also it's just it's super um interesting to me getting back to sort of chat gpt and the the um the way you have a conversation with chat gpt about image mm -hmm. description because yeah. it's not as if you can actually both like if you have two humans and I'm holding something up to you and I'm showing it to you and you're seeing it. And we can talk about, I can point to certain things and I can say, do you see that dot in the upper yeah. left corner? That's yeah. a doodly bug, you know, or something. Yeah. And, and you can't, that's not how chat GPT works, right? It, mm -hmm. it creates the feature embeddings for the images. It matches that with the, you know, the text image pair. So it has embeddings for the text, embeddings for the, for the features that mm -hmm. it's identified or classified. And then, and again, those, those are very, it's very hard for it to understand. I think the depth, yeah. you know, like the depth of field, like if something's in the foreground or something's in the background, a great example this morning I saw on Twitter was a, um, or X was a, um, a, an illusion. It's an mm -hmm. optical illusion where a shadow of a black poodle looks mm -hmm. like a dog, a person walking with two other dogs. Mm -hmm. The conversation, when you put the image into chat GPT chat insists that it's a human and two dogs. Well, uh -huh. it can't actually make out those, that indistinct black blob, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. a human still can. So yeah. But the way I feel about it, though, because I also find examples where AI, because we have we have a part of, of image snippets where we we call a function to AI to mm -hmm. usher and it can come back with a description of the image. We do find a lot of situations where AI can see things that the human can't. It mm -hmm. actually can point out something that's really interesting, like, oh, that's a zebra way in the background. And you're like. Oh, I didn't mm -hmm. quite catch that the first yeah. time I looked at it. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that is so the humans and machines definitely augment each other. Yeah. yeah. But can't you can't just you know, you can't just throw the baby out, you know, with the back. Yeah. Either well, way. Right? And and yeah. a, a piece to that too that that I think a lot of people have started to talk about already on the multimodal piece, which is supposed to make them the the AI uh, smarter, is you know the lack of materials, right? And you know, going back into the the example that you were talking about from the seventies, I think you said, you know, how many images? exist from different time periods. And, and I'll link a video down below of, of a much bigger YouTuber than me. Her name's Bernadette. Um, she is a costume designer that understands historical uh, yeah. 
costume. And so she was going through and asking ChatGPT to do something in a certain period. And then she was like critiquing it. And the problem is there's not a lot of imagery and that imagery is a painting versus a photograph yes. or it's grainy or, you know, all these other things with physical mediums before, you know, a lot of imagery was digital or giant swaths of time, giant swaths of people are yeah. missing from these yeah. things, right? Yeah. Certain classes of people were the ones who had the right. you know, early imagery, whether it was wow. painting or or um, yeah. otherwise. So, and then you have the doctoring of these things. There's, yeah. oh, I, I, someone in the comments, I hope puts it in there. Um, there is a famous painting and I cannot remember who did it, what it's all about, but there was someone, a child that was of African-American descent um, standing with the other children in this uh, painting. And he was oh, painted out. That. Yeah, he was painted out. And he you can paint it out. Yeah, you can faintly see like where yes. it was, you know, yes, doctored, let's say. Yeah. But, you know, how much of that editing is happening, right? Yeah. And I, fast forward, Instagram photos are all doctored too. So like yeah. not saying that doesn't still happen. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's it's those things that I think when we get into multimodal is going to be really tricky because yeah. there's all these extra things yeah. um, that just didn't exist. A lot of digitization projects and archives, for instance, were for the text, right? right. It was for the text. Right. And there's even these lovely, um, not like image snippets, but something similar the National Archives has where it puts up scanned images of handwritten notes and people can go in and try to decipher it. And then there's like yeah. this voting system and like such cool stuff to like decipher what people were talking oh, about. Oh yeah, the crowdsourcing, that kind of. Yeah, uh, but how much of that happens now i know there's there's a few of those again from the national archives for i think maps and things but i don't know if that exists for you know more traditional other types of uh yeah, imagery there's a, there's a huge opportunity here like you know so you know i i think i think there's a lot of things about the web that have been done wrong <laughs> you know and one of them has been you know the fact that the, that a lot of our uploading to social media and different platforms is so um you know frictionless yeah. that this content isn't being really captured and stored in graphable ways that would mm. make that would actually be the magnet that would help pull, you know, it helps surface the really interesting content to the surface, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, to find the needle, but, but like, so getting back to this, um, to the, to the car stuff, the, I happen to be really fond of talking about that too, because yeah. I, I, I actually I ended up uh, running a Porsche restoration facility as well. So I, so vintage Porsche restoration from all the cars from like 1949 to like 1960, you know, 1970 or mm -hmm. whatever that early nine, up to early nine 11. Okay. So I, this is why I have all these really interesting images of Porsche parts to talk about. Right. <laughs> and so, um, so I look, put a, a lot of those into the, into the system yeah. as well. But, you know, there's an awful lot of forums out there that are because there's so many different types of like enthusiasm over different types of and it, well, just the automotive in, industry in general is yeah. just just huge. Right. Oh, so yeah. you've got, and you've got all kinds of enthusiasts. You've got manufacturing, you've got mm -hmm. car sales, you've got you've got automotive restoration, you've got race car drivers, you've got professional racing and amateur racing, and you've got just a huge spectrum of things that people want to find and they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's a lot of content that is on the web that has been there, that's been there for almost 30 years now about a lot of these industries, especially mm -hmm. like, you know, where you have forums where you've got Porsche restoration enthusiasts, and they're they're sharing all this content all the time, and it is multimodal already. Yeah. And but it's like okay, so you know, could that have been captured in a in a better way yeah. from the beginning? Yeah. Because then, like a lot of these, th there's just so much rich descriptive data there. 
I think that's one of the things that I would say would be really difficult for me. Like if I'm looking at any given engine or mechanical piece, there's so many things that make that machine work. It's almost the same problem that you get with event modeling. Where's the beginning and where's the end? Right. It, and right. Especially if it's not in the image. So how do right. you talk about something contextually without having that? And and how do you decide what level of granularity to go to? Level of granularity is huge. Yeah. There's a there's a wonderful article for anybody that's interested in like solid pod stuff that Ver Ruben Verbo wrote. Oh yeah. It's the one about let's talk about po uh, pods or something. But yeah, I think I think what he was getting at it's a fantastic article because he talks about how things um he talks about data uh, things being organized that are document centric versus mm -hmm. data centric and how important it is to figure out the level of granularity because this brings me back to one of the things that's difficult about integrating like the content that that we make in a more interoperable way is mm -hmm. because almost no one goes that next step down right they don't mm -hmm. take the plain text keyword or the plain text description to the next level of granularity down. Mm -hmm. And um, but there's so much rich value there. It's mm -hmm. it's by going to that next step down. Well, now, you're lucky you have a description. Most right. Um, yeah. There's yeah. so much that I find and encounter yeah, where description. Yeah. You don't but add it's just it. gonna get lost again. It's just yeah. gonna get lost. I mean, you <sighs> And is that okay? I don't know. I mean, I think, I personally think that it's absolutely fascinating to be able to find like the part that I shared was like, it's an extremely rare intake manifold. Okay. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing. I put the image into chat GPT and I had been talking already about cars and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it, so I was, so I had been uploading other engine pictures. Mm -hmm. First thing it comes back and says is it says, this is an intake. This is likely an intake manifold. And I'm like, what? Mm. Are you kidding me? It like figured that out, right? Yeah. But this, this strange thing is, is that it could only do that once. Mm. I did queries on it repeatedly for like the next, like, you know, 48 hours <laughs> and, it, and it's one time it would say it was an intake manifold another mm -hmm. time it would say it was a pipe another type time it would say well it's oh everyone talks about the inconsistency the inconsistency yeah. and so and then um and then obviously so much for repeatability and research so right like good luck with that right good luck with that right exactly on a right. different one <laughs> um but like i do wonder that contextualization is, is so important, but it's always just such a hard nut to crack because, you know, um, a good example is um, I watch uh, another person that's much bigger on YouTube than I am. Um, and he does things with like cool um, retro gaming, like video oh, yeah. game, like Atari and do all that stuff. Um, and he, he digs this stuff out of like people's houses, you know, that are that don't even realize they have it. So he does that. But then he also does like retro car stuff. And I, I mean, again, I like cars. I like retro cars specifically. Yeah. But like, what would you tag all of that with? Like right. all of his videos, right? Like they're kind of a, a combination of the two. And even more so, he's going in and finding these super rare, super unique things on a channel that is mostly dedicated to antiques. So would you ever find that stuff if exactly. you were just a regular watcher and the answer is no you probably no. wouldn't and no. this is just such a common issue with things that are image or voice or or you know moving of those two video um where there's so many different things that are talked about or there's an aside or there's you know maybe um, a good example is there's another um, YouTuber. I don't really like them, but they have this beautiful piece of art behind them that I saw once. And it's a local artist. Um, and I wanted to purchase it. And I didn't have the money to purchase it. I went back when I finally did. It was gone. And this person has it. And I see it in the back of their video all the what time. What a cool synchronicity, though. I know. It's and I'm like, oh. Yeah. And like, oh. 
I know. And, but like, if it was total happenstance that I saw this, so, oh, yeah, total but, synchronicity. I but the it. data exists there, right? Oh, and it's like, sure. well, how do we get to that? Or right. Really I mean, this is something where I feel like we've we've had this technology for 30 years for a long time. And, yeah. and going back to Tim to Tim Berners-Lee, which is another great little antidote, because I had the great, great, great pleasure of being able to. Um, I was at a decentralized web camp by the Internet Archive and mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco in 2019. And I got and I was the only person at camp with a link data application mm -hmm. and uh, Tim Berners-Lee was there to talk about solid. And we got yeah. to talk for like four days for like, what? I got to hang out. That's and so I, cool. Oh my God. It's like the <laughs> coolest antidote ever, yeah. you know? And so we got to hang out and, um, and, you know, we, we, we started talking about all the things, how image snippets could be used with solid pods, how it could be, you know, and, and we talked about all kinds of different things, access control and context, mm -hmm. and all kinds of different interesting things. And um, so ultimately he was like, you know, just, I, I said, well, you know, I've thought about kind of using it to build data sets for, you know, AI and stuff like that. And he said, well, you know, that would be fashionable, but yeah. and then he said, you know, and then he said, but, you know, just keep making triples, <laughs> you know, just keep making triples, like, because eventually this is going to, it has to, because it's like you said, like, the, the, it, to me, and I've made a post about this this morning, it's like the garbage pile is just going to keep sort of getting yeah. larger, yeah. and these hard to find mm -hmm. items which we should have been able to find. See, I have people come to me who say things like, um, I need a picture of the underside of the A pillar on a 1952 <laughs> Porsche model 356, you know, pre A cabriolet. I want to see how the, um, how your restorer did the yeah. um, tuck under the, the, um, you know, at the upholstery, mm -hmm. you know, on the interior. Like, so we have these things and we should be able to, we should have been able to find these things for a long time because doing, saving things as structured data, like from a description is we, you know, it's actually not that bad. I mean, we have techniques for doing entity matching, you yeah. know, of, and, and just for doing a little, a little bit of NLP, you don't even have to do, you know, that you know that much right yeah. i mean yeah. you do have to do it you do need a human though you do need a human. yeah there's so much to to that you know what it kind of reminds me of it's like mudlarkers do you know what a mudlarker is <laughs> no, so mudlarkers um are there's a whole genre on youtube for mudlarkers okay and it is people that um wait until you know like a river bet the river thames right in okay. london it, you know, gets flooded and then it goes down to just mud sometimes. Right, and right. so there are people all across the globe that go into places like this where it's just a very old place of civilization and they start to dig up things in oh. mud and it's usually trash. It's trash from Victorian <laughs> right, right, era right, right. or 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 something even earlier than that. And they do this because these are forgotten areas of yes. life. For this and I almost feel like there's going to be this resurgence of you know modern uh mud larkers for for data and imagery with these multimodal as they get more like not the large language models but the small language models that yeah, people are talking yeah. about where they need like these very dedicated kinds of data sets like there's going to be the the Ferraris uh exactly. you know data set there's exactly. going to be like all these things very they domain are, specific. Exactly. And it could be about anything. It can be about, you know, rebuilding vintage clocks. It can yep. be about uh, vintage guitars. I also had to to sell a large estate of vintage collectible, mm. like pre-Civil War Martins. And, mm. you know, just the, like the tuners and the mm -hmm. head stuff. Like, mm -hmm. All of that is, um, all of those little details are really important. And it's really important to, to be able to find those models, you know, so what you get is you get a ton of pictures that often are um, to a, you know, to me, they look fine. Okay. This looks like a 9-11. It looks like mm. an and then, or 
I mean, this is a bad example, but but because they want more specific, you know, a mm. more specific model. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you sit next to a subject matter expert and they're scrolling along and they go like, no, you know, that's an earlier model. That's a, you know, this, yeah. this model had the carburetors replaced. This model had, you know, yeah. and it's like, like you, like you, you know, they can spot inconsistency. Yeah. Well, oh, spot, wow. but I also used yeah. to work with some guys that they could identify the vehicle and the year and yeah. even the model to a certain oh, extent yeah. based on the sound of the engine. Yes. yes and it's like, exactly. oh, you know, yeah. how, how oh, do you that's do that? a great thing to, to do. See, and there's no reason why that can't be mapped together in a knowledge graph. Yes. With an image talking about multimodal data sets, yeah. you could put, yeah. you could put that, you could put the sound with that same thing with guitars, you know, people yeah. who identify, you know, it's a Telecaster versus a Fender Strat. Yeah. And yeah. then they can identify whether it was a tube amp or, you know, yeah. like a, another type of amp from later on a solid state amp from later yeah. on. You well, know, it, so it gets into the, you know, how is it preserved kind of stuff too, because, you know, okay, you're, you're looking at this, this painting, um, and it's been lost to fire or whatever. I mean, fires and floods and bugs I'm are the three yeah. top reasons anything has been destroyed. Yeah. Right. Um, and the first two often happen because of people, not necessarily nature. Yeah. Right. Um, so well, it, it is, there is this thing about impermanence. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah well, yeah, you yeah. know, and if mm -hmm. you've, you've only got this, this photograph of this painting, is it still the painting or is it the photograph? Oh, gosh, right? what a great question. Oh, yeah. you can go to cars like that, too, because it's like yeah. you can say, like, is this a restoration or a recreation? Yeah. Like, it's, did you, you know, did you just find a VIN number and like stamp it on a, yeah. on a you know, on a frame that you already, yeah. you know, that yeah. you recreated? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Well, that's a whole nother topic for just how you <laughs> put an identity on on digital items with with a knowledge. Yeah, of, right. Well, they, it, they have to, yeah, it's interesting is too. It the thing or is it a representation of the thing? You yeah, know, and the, and, the and you can get problem. very uh, Inception yeah. movie yeah. Inception with that. But yeah. you know, I did see somebody else. Um, you know, everyone's like, "What's the trends?" You know, coming up, the whole like. Um, smart glasses are going to really become a thing. Um, I still don't know if I believe that. But one thing that I kind of think is cool is similar to how Google Maps, right, had the Google car going around just like taking giant scans yeah. of, of everything. Is that what we're going to see sort of with the multimodal, but with glasses? So if you're walking around, you're uh, like, this is a this, this is a that, this is this, and, and it's it's cataloging, and you do it purposely. It's not just like you're walking around and it's doing it and you don't realize. But I do wonder if we're going to start start to see some of that show up. Yeah, and, that's an interesting point. And I don't even know can can you use the Google Glasses both ways? Like, can you if you can use it to to record? You can and that. Okay. See, I haven't, I haven't really played with those really, not really. Yeah. I, so I was in the right place, right time. Um, when the Google glass was given out as like a lot of, um, trials, yeah. uh, Carnegie Mellon university, of course, got a bunch of them and I was going to school there oh, wow. when that happened. So it was the most ridiculous thing. I remember walking across slushy, gross Pittsburgh winter, right? <laughs> getting splashed by a bus of freezing cold water and walking across a bridge and, and going to class and seeing a bunch of students walking around going like this because they had them on and they were like doing stuff with it. And it was the most right. ridiculous thing I ever saw. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're going to have to get over some hurdles for this to become a normal thing, but yeah, for, yeah. for very specific use cases, like we're talking yeah. here to really start to capture and annotate more importantly with humans, um, all the different things that they are seeing and in the still, world. And I'm still curious just like how well that, okay, even as impressive as Google, as computer vision is, okay, I'm pointing at a car and I say, this is a, um, you know, 1952 Porsche Prié Cabriolet. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's fine. But then if I say it was the first one owned by, Mm. you know, some famous race mm -hmm. car driver from the 50s. Okay. That is not ever, like, 
the computer vision is really, if you think about how it actually works, okay, it's going to like, it's going to map the pixels, mm. that information. And then is it going to just generalize like every time? Like, it, yeah. And then, yep. and I think yep. it's, or it's, you know, Cabriolet yep. that it was owned by this person. Well, but you that's know? where like, supplementing yeah. LLMs or, you know, any machine learning with structured knowledge is important because right. owned by is owned by. a relation, right? Relation. So maybe yep. it picks up that that's not yes. a description of the vehicle in front vehicle. of you, but an oh. ownership model. An ownership. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That's a really excellent point. Yeah. Because it is when you start having the conversations with chat GPT, you can see where the computer vision stops, mm -hmm. you know, and the feature, the, the feature embeddings and the, you know, that where you can see where the clip system stops. Yeah. Because that's where you can stop. That's where you stop actually being able to have a conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's not it, out what you have a conversation about is any of that text. So yeah. you can talk about intake manifolds. You can't talk about the fact that this happens to be like from a rare 1100cc motor because it doesn't know, even if you say, well, do you see the four bolts? It's got a yeah. four bolt pattern instead yeah. of a three bolt pattern. Yeah. Okay. That is, it, it's not ever, you're not ever going to be able to sort of transcend that gap. Well, it, it, is it a gap though? That's the question. So right. I, I almost feel like there's, it often happens in search and retrieval. There is search and then there is retrieval, right? Right. And when you're doing a search, right, I think what we're talking about is oftentimes considered training data, right, where it does have to be more generalized. And yes, yeah. you have to kind of get all generalized to the point where all of those specialities are just noted and it understands there's specialities like that. But not to the point where it will tell you this is the that this specific instance Correct. of this vehicle oh, was absolutely. owned by this famous race car absolutely. driver. That's retrieval. I'm right. looking for that specific thing right. or the, some, you know, o things owned by that specific person or, you know, something like that, where that is a retrieval, right? Like the, right. Mo the models have already been trained and, right. and they are smart enough to say, okay, this is the specific type of, of vehicle and here's like the generalities about it. But then here are all the like additional add-on stuff. And then those are just used as, you know, individual data points that can be retrieved if that is what yes. you're yeah. yeah. So I think it, it's yeah. important, especially with multimodal to, under, to, to understand which piece of the pipeline you're in. Because if you're in the pre-training stage, that's one thing. The other one that I think is the perception, you know, going back to your example yeah. of, is it a poodle or is it two people walking to two different dogs? Um, if you're going around as a human and you don't know the difference or, you know, human perception oh, yeah. isn't perfect, right? No, like, no, absolutely. So maybe you this thought really this was point. this thing and it's really not. So yeah. that's another part of the pipeline we really have oh, to about, which is like, truthfulness and accuracy yeah. and that kind of stuff. And then there's well, the retrieval of it. And then if it's like, if, it, okay, so I worked on this vision challenge that had to do with creating, um, uh, creating data for training in, mm -hmm. in a data centric pipeline, right. Mm -hmm. For machine learning. And, and it was really interesting because one of the things that came up was that there was these, uh, these, uh, that one of the challenges was to get better at classifying hawks. Okay. But even the train, even the data that was used to do the data selection from to begin with was messy with mm -hmm. hawks and peregrine falcons and golden eagles and other mm -hmm. types of predator birds that not everybody would know. So the question became a really, really interesting question, which is like if 15 iterators all say this is a hawk. Is it a hawk? Is it a hawk or is it not? Does, uh -huh. that, does that mean we're going to lose species? <laughs> like, are we going to yeah. lose species because we, like, are we, go, are we going backwards because we're going to overgeneralize? Yeah. To, to well, get... that, that happens in language a lot, right? Yeah, like right. when um, a, a good example is it's a moot point. Yeah. Every person on the planet uses that incorrectly. Moot yeah. does not actually mean 
what it means in that sentence. Right. And I remember being in an English class of, in somewhere um, and, and my, my teacher saying that, and, you know, then fast forward, cause that was like high school or something. Yeah. I've become a computational linguistic person. Right. And I'm like, but if everyone is using it using in that it. way, is it actually is it not correct anymore or has it morphed? Right. Has like language morphed? is constantly changing. Yeah, so it's constantly changing. does moot actually yeah. mean that now? Yeah, 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 everyone yeah. uses it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. One thing that I think is really super fascinating, which we can't have time to get into today, is that I would love to talk to you sometime about your um, thoughts about um, Daniel Everett and the um, Pidiha language. And because myself and Pat Hayes have often mm -hmm. talked about how much that's like RDF, because it's in the perpetual present, right? Yeah. And there's no recursion in it. So it's yeah. so interesting. Like, and that's just another side point. Oh, I'll yeah. Oh, yeah. It, but, yeah, but anyway. Oh, that's so funny. I never yeah. thought of it that way, but that is so but true. <laughs> it is. Like, I've been reading that yeah. book, you know, and looking at the language, and 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 Pat and I are both like, oh, my God, this is a, so much like like RDF, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and I mean, that's the thing. Like, maybe it's all snapshots in time. Like, so yeah, to your point exactly. on, you know, is it is it this kind of, of falcon or or not? And I would, I would, I would challenge and say, like, if you've got a, you know, a larger data set and you look at the researchers, I guarantee people are going to know the difference. Yeah. So, you know, that's where the the yeah. expertise of your annotators um, is, is important to important. understand what you need versus what you want and what's possible. And then the yeah. other thing is, is that ultimately the AI can be better depending on the data set you've trained on, you can be better at recognizing species than humans are, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's not going to do that with some sort of like general classification model, right? So, yeah. but I think it's just fascinating to think about how the AI is trained to begin with, that you need like, you know, hundreds of thousands of samples as opposed to, you know, like people like to make the 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 you know um show that children you know children need like two examples yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they can yeah. tell the difference like this is a bass and this is a yeah fish. yeah you know yeah. like it's like they, they know yeah. like really good. well I think that's part so, of the argument about multimodal is you know they're saying at least the researchers are saying this at least that okay you you show a child two examples and they can figure out the difference it's because they can see it. And, and they can touch it and they can, they can gather more data to oh, distinguish the between the two. And that's why they're saying, yes. you know, multimodal is, is going to make the AI smarter because it's going yes. to have more of that experience. Exactly. Except it's not a human, so it doesn't have experiences. <laughs> it's right. just taught, you know, right. Right. patterns. That's all machine learning is, is patterns. It's, it's just patterns. Yeah. yeah. Now, can you, can you learn the patterns of humans for sure? But again, like it's a generalization. So it's not meant to tell you exactly what, you know, Margaret Warren is, is doing today. Like they're, you know, could they try to predict based on some of your habits? Of course, like that's yeah. what machine learning is all about. Right. Um, but yeah, like when you get into the multimodal, I think that this exact, you know, all of the things that we've talked about in this video is, is why, you know, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this stuff coming oh, up absolutely. in this year and, and, you know, seeing some, some work new ways for annotations and yeah. new data yeah. sets and like all yeah. these other things, because, um, you know, it's, and now there's the other piece, which is now you have text and text is hard enough to do compute on, but yeah. now you're doing moving images and you're, and these things, the oh, yeah. sizes are much bigger. Yeah. And so you're already seeing a lot of the, you know, it takes, you know, this much, you know, emissions to run a model in chat GPT. And, you know, then do we have enough chips to do it? Right. And, you know, all of that stuff is only going to be compounded with multimodal. So it oh. will be a very interesting year to see where this all goes, yeah. how we're going to figure it out. And I mean, honestly, you know, at some where where's the line going to be where, you know, paying humans for actually really good content, you know, <laughs> or finding a way that in part of the consumption of the, of the product where, where you have these places where like domain, you know, in, in certain domains, you have sets of humans that are capable of doing this annotation in the course of doing their regular work, 
Mm-hmm. Maybe with something like Google Glasses, okay, and where they're or something like that. I yeah. don't. To me, they like you said, they all. See, it seems it's all yeah. it seemed very awkward to me whenever yeah. I, you know, even I think I put on a pair once, but I didn't really <laughs> examine it very much. I mean, you know, it's like, and that was years ago, but it's like, um, you know. W- yeah. At what point is the cost going to become, and I'm hoping that it is this year. I mean, I've been, you Oh, know, it's already there. Are you talking about yeah, like using yeah. the, the, the better yeah. data sets and the human yeah. instead of the, it's yeah. already there. Here's yeah. I, there's um an article that recently came out about, um, Oh, what is it? Um, one of the music Spotify. Yeah. Music yeah. on Spotify, uh, had a lot of human curation for playlists and now they're, you know, very hard set on just going pure AI. And again, I'm not a naysayer against AI. I mean, I I'm work in AI, either. but I think that the, the, the pushback is always that I have seen at least is, well, humans are really good, but really inconsistent. And that's accurate, right? But that's kind of what you're going for almost when you're doing human annotation is you're trying to figure out all those inconsistencies and then train the model and it makes it more consistent, except, you know, when you're talking about LLMs and then it's not consistent at all. (laughs) So um, I, I think it's that dichotomy between a lot of folks just being so hard set that human in the loop is unnecessary. It's messy. There's also this understanding that, well, humans are always more costly than doing an automation. And I, I, that has just been a fallacy a since fallacy. day one of it machine learning. It is a learning. fallacy, day learn. Yeah. Well, it's because, you know, everybody started using Mechanical Turk, right? And they said, you know, it's faster to use Mechanical Turk. And then you get people gaming Mechanical Turk. I mean, the most yeah. the first thing that happened is people decided to, you know, one, send images to, to porn sites so that people <laughs> logging into porn sites would, you know, yeah. quickly go through, you know, whatever they were doing to yeah. in order to get to the next thing, to get to yeah. the next thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And, then, and then so they're, they don't care. So you get yeah. really poor quality of data yeah. or they start sending it to buys. And now the thing is, let's just... I'm going to resend all this stuff to GPT to GPT to have it do all the annotation yeah. for me. And then, so now we've got this regurgitative, you know. Oh yeah. It's, it's right. the snake there's eating a, its own tail. tail. Yeah. That, yeah, that whole great, thing is happening. Um, yeah. Inside the AI factory is a great article about yeah. that. Um, yeah. 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 Is, you know, is our ontology able to be used consistently or more or less consistently? And it's actually designed to be used in the kind of an intuitively ambiguous way anyway, which is another interesting artifact. We published a paper on this called Bounding Ambiguity because it gives you enough utility in the relationship between the item to the image without sort of overburdening the cognitive load required to like really have to think about what category does this go into. And um, so, but I give this test to, um, to people when I onboard them and you're right, you'll get, I, I can get about, you know, 80% consistency in using it. But there is a type of brain pattern. I there swear is. it's a brain pattern there where is. you just have an indexer's brain. You can, you can, yeah. you can do the, I don't even want to call it mental gymnastics, but to, it's, to the point of, is this, is this the image of that painting or is it the painting? Like oh, yeah. well, that's working a- through yeah that that. is this um and maybe this is just the bad taxonomy but you know is this rice and farming or is this rice farming yeah i mean what what do you think well yeah well so in our so for example we've got like distinctions like depicts looks like shows conveys so what we did is we we use these words and there's a whole paper on this so it's all about like like how you can have a word that doesn't have too much conceptual baggage or the conceptual baggage that it comes with actually sort of matches mm. what, what an average like association with that word would be. I mean, it's pretty clear that depicts is, is usually used a lot. That was in FOAF, right? FOAF mm. depiction. Okay. So oh. fo FOAF, I say FOAF. Oh, okay. <laughs> FOAF. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. Both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this kind of goes into a little bit of um, like when you were talking about the um, per- whether it's purposeful or, 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 or not, but 
there are certain con concepts that what do you have an image for, right? Like I've, I've had this issue oh, yeah. constantly <laughs> when I'm developing a UI that has an image that is supposed to represent anything in a knowledge graph. So you end up going into um, a lot of iconography, which is fine, right? But outside of that, you know, when you're seeing an image of a bar chart and the bar chart is depicting something very specific, uh, not to overload depicting, because I don't know Margaret's distinction between the two, but, you know, what is it representing? The whole world is going to learn it. Yeah. yeah. Like, is is this a bar chart or is this a bar chart that is representing some, something very yeah, specific? Yeah. Oh, or, yeah. You know, what is the image to uh, represent air? Yeah. You, know, you can have yeah. the chemical compound, you can have wind blowing or, you know, like there's all these nebulous things that you talk it's about and how do you tag something like that? Yeah, it's interesting to look at Wikidata, Wikidata or not Wikidata, Wikipedia sometimes and see like what images people have picked for the yeah. graphic image to go with some concept, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, um, yeah, exactly. How, how do you tag and how do you tag that to find those things? Yeah. So we had intended for the, for the word conveys to uh, represent um, something that might be an idea, a metaphorical, like an, a concept, but not necessarily another entity, like not a thing, mm -hmm. you know? So we had intended it to be more of an idea like sadness, like you could convey sadness. Oh, it's, but, it's like, a, it's yeah. almost like a metaphor instead of the thing yeah. itself. Instead of the thing itself. Yeah. And so, but people would say, well, this image conveys a poodle. I'm like, where did you, you know? Not just the ambiguity, but things that, you know, in different cultures just go by different oh, things, absolutely. different imagery. Like there was a great yeah. article and I wish I could find it um, where it was showing um, a uh, image. It was a cartoon image of a boy kicking a ball with a dog running after it. And they were basically going through this exercise that when someone is looking at it, they see it and they start to assess what in their world and in, in their background that they would associate with those things. Now, depending on what culture you're from, or, you know, if you were bit by a dog, maybe you would think the dog is going after the little boy, or maybe you think the dog you love dogs and, you know, the little boy is playing with a dog. It's, it's Schrodinger's cat all over again, right? Yeah. Where it's, it's both, it's all of them. It's and of them. that's true. What do you tag it with? And and I think that like that's where you get into that that world of maybe you don't need to tag it. You need to represent it as true to form as possible. And then there's the rest of, of the humanness of I'm going to take Absolutely. this and I'm going to use it for a specific no. specific reason. Maybe I'm doing Google searches to find out what doesn't come back for that Google search. Right? Like, like that kind of an anti-search well, stuff that I not? always do. I like what one of the things that what I like to do is 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 layer different. You can layer the different contexts, right? So like I could say this is like I'm not gonna know for sure, right? Like the hawk example. I'm not gonna know for sure. I mean, may, maybe I think it's a daisy or something like that, but maybe, you know, maybe I just say, well, it's a yellow flower or, I mean, an AI can do this, right? But then mm -hmm. you get like an entire data set of yellow flowers, and then you can have someone come along and they can tell you more about it, but then you may get someone more specific and they might model it in an entirely different way. They you know, as somebody that is a professional, you know, um, in, in this space of imagery and metadata, and especially with this new year of, you know, trends into more multimodal, what are some of the maybe tips or, or things that you would, um, maybe ask people to just watch out for or be cautious of or, you know, really pay attention to. I think it's real. I think it'd be really interesting for people to uh, just observe that in their own, more carefully in their own experience of working with the images on the web. It's like, can I get an AI to describe this? Can I get it to describe it well enough for accessibility for mm. people who are disabled or, um, cognitively or or vision disabled in some mm. way or vision challenged um, um, or and and also like because description is just a very different process 
yeah than making something up out yeah. of yeah yeah well, and be careful what you're training the, the models on too, on. from an yeah. image perspective. And the other, the other thing, yeah, is um, I think it's to, you know, I think I, I, you know, love people to call me and you know, talk to me about more about this because I, because I think that we, we can be a big help in building more uh, specific, very precise data sets for training, mm -hmm. uh, especially multimodal data sets that involve mm -hmm. text and, and imagery and I also think that, um, oh, there's an awful lot of topics, but I think those are, those are pretty good. I don't know, unless you think I'm missing something. But, no, I think those yeah, are good. I yeah. mean, also just like, you know, who's doing the tagging is maybe who's another thing. The tagging. Yeah, yeah. The fact that you've, yeah, do you have subject matter experts? And you are right about who's going to search. I think that was my final point on that was, you know, who are you tagging it for? I mean, there's a lot on this, right? On like when you're doing keywording, who do you think is going to be searching for those mm -hmm. images in general? So the same thing applies when you're doing, when you're doing keywording, you know, a lot of what we do is keywording that it just uses, but it uses Wikidata and Dbpedia and it, and well, and you can custom create entities. Too. Yeah. Not yeah. just not just those data sets, but but like um, you know, trying to pull out like the most, just trying to grasp like what is the most um, the most um, salient kind of not necessarily low hanging fruit, but what is the thing that is most rich about this image? Like a picture of a rocket launching into space. The thing that's most interesting is that is what rocket was it? You know, what was the year? You know, you're looking at that kind of context, right? And so context is a big thing. To yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, a loaded word. I mean, a lot of people don't really like that word context a lot because it has so many meanings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, so that's another thing. Yeah. 